chapter 10. So we are going to study credit market imperfection. So we're going to talk about different type of market imperfection and how these different type of market imperfection affects the credit market. And eventually it's going to affect consumers' consumption and saving decision and some welfare implications. Here's the roadmap of this chapter. So we're going to talk about credit market imperfection. Essentially, we're going to look at the asymmetric information and limited information. So I'm going to explain to you what this means and how this is going to affect the financial market and how that's going to affect consumption and the safety decision. Right? And then we are going to also look at the social security. That's kind of another type of market imperfection. So this first, just look at overview of credit market imperfection. The credit market imperfection usually is going to lead to different interest rates for lenders and the borrowers, right? So if you deposit the money in a bank, usually you are a lender, you're kind of a lender, right? You lend your money to the, to the bank. So usually you have R, or sometimes you call R1 or whatever. And if you're a borrower, right? So you borrow money from the bank, usually maybe you call it RD or R2, whatever we are gonna call. Okay, so let's call it R1, R2. If you're a borrower, and usually this interest rate is gonna higher, right? This is usually what we experience. But then in this chapter, I'm gonna to explain to you why, why this is the case. Why borrowing rate usually is higher than saving rate. By the way, here, the lender, meaning you are saving. Borrower, right? So you just borrow, right? So you just borrow money from the bank. The other market imperfection show up as borrowing limit, meaning so there's certain amount you can borrow from the bank or from financial institutes. There are many reasons why there's some imperfection. And here we are going to focus on two. First, it's called asymmetric information. That just means, so if you are doing trade or if you are doing business with somebody else, okay, usually, so one party has more information than the other regarding to the goods we are trading with each other, right? So the famous example is a used car. So we are going to have one slide to show that. So how this asymmetric information show up in the, the used car market and how, how that affects the market equilibrium. The other reason is because limited commitment. This is essentially, it's almost impossible to commit to pay off your debt when you borrow in the future. But you're, you always have the temptation to default because to default without any punishment, Usually, it's always, it always an uh, optimal solution for you. But that's the expense of why. So there's some like punishment, right? But this punishment usually is probably is perfect. And this punishment is going to distort the market, particularly the interest rate. Right? So I want to emphasize both type of credit imperfection. I mean, it's, it's asymmetric information and limited commitment play a key role during the 2008 and 2000 financial crisis. Now let's look at the credit market imperfection, like through a, through a lens of the model. Yeah. So let's use R1 to denote lending rate and R2 to denote the borrowing rate. Okay. So we understand that. So this R1 usually is the saving rate you will be offered when you deposit money in the bank. And R2 is the borrowing rate you are going to face when you borrow from the bank, either for your car or for your house or for student loan. Right. To summarize here, lender can lend at a lower interest rate than the one faced by borrower. So now what is, what is asymmetric information or why this asymmetric information cause the phenomenon we, are, we usually observe? So the borrowing rate is higher than saving rate. So first, let me define 
asymmetric information. Asymmetric information arises when one party has more information than the other it is trading with. Now let me give you an example. In the used car market, the salesman or the owner of the used car usually know the quality of a particular car, know the history of this car, right? So whether it has accident, how big is the accident, the cause of the accident, right? And how often do you maintain, right? So the sales or the owners know more than the buyers knows. So in that sense, information is not symmetric. So these two parties have different information regarding to the goods they are trying to trade with each other. And usually, usually the sales, and in this case, the sales side has more information than the buy side. Right. Another example. I know how hard I work today, but not necessarily my boss, right? Okay, so these are two examples to show you. So these two parties usually have different knowledge regarding to some key information. So this asymmetric information was first discovered by Arkelow and he won Nobel Prize for his, for his contribution. And this is called the market for lemons. Lemons is just some like inferior goods. Right? So let's just use these simple things as an example. So just imagine if there's a car, right? And the natural is going to choose how good the car is. It's good and bad with equal probability, like 50, 50%, 50, 50%. Okay, so just imagine the, offer, the buyers offer a price and then the sellers accept or reject. So this is how the game plays. But clearly, so the buyer and sellers has different information, right? Let's just say if the good car is gonna worth 35,000, okay, so it means a zero. But if the bad one is only worth 28,000, the question is how much might the buyer offer and which car is going to be sold. So now let's look at this market. The buyer is willing to offer 31,000. Why is that? Remember with 50% chance, the car is worth 35,000. The other one, let's go back. The other one is 28,000, 28,000. Right? So this is a 50-50% chance. If you're a buyer, I would say you're probably not willing to buy, pay 35,000. Because with 50% chance, you're getting a bad car. But certainly no, so if I only offer 28,000, I'm not going to get a car. Right? Because nobody's going to sell to me except the, the worst car. But this is not what I, what I want. And then so probably I'm going to, as a buyer, so I'll probably just offer the price in the middle. Okay, so this number is just average number, right? 31,000. Now the buyers make offer. Let's see the sales side. The car, the good car owners, what are they gonna do? So they're not gonna sell. Why? Because their car, they knew their car, the car is gonna worth 35,000. But he only offered me 31,000. No, I'm not going to sell my car. What about the bad car owners? For sure, they're going to sell. And they're eager to sell. They're eager to cut the deal. Why? Because their car is only worth 28,000. But now the deal is going to be 31,000. They're going to make a 3,000 profit. Right? So this is what is going to happen from the sales side. Now let's go back to the buy side. The buyers knew this, right? So they're gonna see, okay, so this is what's gonna happen. Right. So what the buyer is gonna do? So you can only offer 28,000. Why? Right? Because whatever, because look at it here, right? So if I offer 35,000, 
Okay? And every, everyone has witnessed sell to me. I cannot tell who is a good car, who is a bad car. Right? This is not good. If I offer any price in the middle, right? So the good car is not going to sell because it's going to be below their price, below their value. Only the bad car, or in other words, any price below this one, I only is going to attract bad car owners. If that's the case, why not I just offer the minimum price and then I'm going to buy the buy a car, right? So first of all, what happened in equilibrium? In this case, because of the uh, our asymmetric information, I mean, the buyer doesn't know the quality of the car. I cannot tell which one's good, which one's bad. No good car will be sold in the equilibrium. So the good car seller is not willing to bring their car to the market. Right. So this is called asymmetric invention. Right. It's large because the buyers cannot tell which one is good and which one is bad. Right. So this is in the car market. Now let's look at financial market. Okay. Or you think about the banking market, banking sector. We call it financial intermediaries, which is essentially including bank or any financial institutes that can lend money to you. Right, so usually this is gonna work through a bank. So here we just call like financial intermediaries. The deposit rate is R1 and the loan rate is R2, All right? So here I just write R1, R2, Later, so I'm going to show you this R1 is going to less than R2 for good reason. For the moment, so we don't impose any restriction on that. So it could be the case R1 equal R2. But at the end, I'm going to show you this must be the case. Right? And why this must be the case is because of asymmetric information. First of all, this is from the bank and bank side. Now let's look at from the borrower side, okay. you have many borrowers, let's use the pie to denote all the borrowers. There's some good borrowers, there's some bad borrowers, all right? They just use a fraction. So the good borrower here is one, sorry, A, a fraction of A are good borrowers, meaning they always pay back their loan on time. Why they do that? So maybe because of reputation or, or other things. On the other hand, so you have a small fraction, one minus A, they always default for some reason, right? But from the bank, they don't, they don't know. They don't know who's a good borrower, who's the bad borrowers. Yes, in reality, so you have credit score, but credit score is not the perfect predictor to tell who is going to default, right? But the, furthermore, the credit score actually is a way to address this asymmetric information. But now let's say there's no credit score. You cannot tell who is who. You only know a fraction of our population. They are good borrowers, always pay off, pay back on time. And then there's a small fraction of bad borrowers, always default. So now this asymmetric information show up as the following. Bank cannot tell the good borrowers from the bad ones, right? And all good borrowers are identical. They borrow amount of ale, right? And what the bad borrower is gonna do? So yeah, they're gonna default. The certainty, the more they borrow, the better of there will be, right? Because if I just borrow, so say for example, if L is $1,000, right? So those good borrowers, they borrow L, because here we just, we just simplify, they're identical, right? But in reality, it could be they, they, they are different. Some borrow 1,000, some borrow 10,000. So simplify, each of them borrow 1,000. Now, the bad borrowers, what they can do, certainly the more they borrow, say for example, they borrow 10,000 and default, it's better than they borrow 1,000 and then default, right? Because essentially they're still 10,000 from the bank, right? 
Oh, by the way, for the moment, just forget about the law, forget about court, forget the police, right? So as a matter of fact, those things is, a, is part of the, a solution to this asymmetric information, right? But clearly, the bank is going to notice the difference. Right? Because those good borrowers, they borrow 1,000, and those, someone borrowed 10,000, it sounds fishy. And very likely, it's going to be a bad borrowers. And knowing this, the bank is not going to lend to you. So that means this is not a good strategy for bad borrowers. What they're going to do? So they're going to pretend to be a good borrower. They're going to borrow the same amount as good borrowers. Now, meaning, so you have these this amount of, of borrowers, everyone borrow L. I don't know who is good and who is bad. Now let's see, so what is going to be the average profit for the bank? Okay. So first of all, this is a cost. This is a total cost for the bank, right? Because the bank need to get, get deposit, okay, L. And then, so in turn, we get the deposit. So they're going to pay your interest, one plus R1, right? This is coming from the lender, meaning like savers, or meaning us, right? So you and me, so we just deposit in the bank. They're going to pay us a R1. Okay, so here, I did not say anything regarding the R1 and R2, but I'm going to show you what are they're going to, what's going to be their relationship. Maybe only one thing we know is R1 is greater than zero and R2 is, is greater than zero. Right, if the interest rate is zero or less than zero, negative, you probably won't lend to the bank, right? Or you probably won't deposit in the bank. On the other hand, on the other hand, so if the lending rate is less than, less than zero, the bank probably is not going to, is probably not going to lend, right? Because they are not going to make any profit. So now let's see. So what is going to be the revenue? A fraction of A, they borrow L, right? And then so I'm going to charge, the bank is going to charge this amount of interest rate. And then you have one minus A fraction. They always default. You get nothing from, the, from them. This A plus one minus A, that's the total population. Remember here, we just look at a fraction, right? So here, maybe you can say, okay, so this for each L amount of loan, what is the profit? Now we can do a simple algebra and uh, we end up this profit. Profit per loan, that means per L dollar, equal to L times this amount, right? They just combine all the terms. Now in equilibrium, usually we say the profit equal to zero, right? So in this intermediate micro or even in principle of micro, we knew that, right? So if the profit is positive, and then there are more banks going to join. Right, because there's benefit, there's incentive for me to join because there's positive profit. Now, if the profit is negative, and then the bank is going to leave, right? It doesn't make sense to stay. And then, so, in, so this entry and the exit is going to drive the profit to zero. So this is what happened in equilibrium. Now, if pi equal to zero, we end up with this equation. So essentially, this term equal to zero. We end up this equation. Now, from this equation, what do we what do we learn? Remember, a is a fraction, right? So this is a fraction of good borrowers. And then, so clearly, so this immediately implies r two is greater than r one, or maybe just precise greater than or equal to. Now let's think about the two extreme cases. If a equal to one, everyone is honest and good borrowers. And that's R1 equals R0, R1 equals R2, right? Because uh, the, the bank is going to get or is their loans back, right? So there's no default. On the other hand, if A close to zero, and clearly, so R2 is going to go to infinity or increase. Meaning so if A, a decrease, R is going to, R2 lending rate is going to, sorry, borrowing rate is going to increase. What's the intuition? So essentially, so when A decrease, 
meaning that more people is going to default. Meaning, so it becomes more risky to do to do this lending and borrowing business. And then so you must offer a higher lending rate to the bank to compensate the, the risk they are going to they're going to endure. Right. But in any case, so here from this simple example, so we understand this asymmetric asymmetric information, right? Coming from A and then one plus A, or one minus A, because we don't know, we cannot tell who is who. If you can tell who is who, and the problem is not going to lend to them, this is going to disappear. Now, because you cannot tell, and then you end up with this equation. But this equation will tell us R2 is going to greater than R1, right? Okay, so here's what we just discussed. If A equal to one, and this, these two equal to each other. Otherwise, R2 is going to be greater than R1, meaning the borrowing rate is going to be higher than deposit rate. Now, this higher borrowing rate is going to use to compensate the risk the bank is going to take, right? Because they cannot tell who is who. Right. Now, let's see what this means to the households. Now, households, we need to differentiate two types, right? Depending on your endowment, depending on your position in the budget constraint. If you're a lender, meaning you're safe, you're saver, okay? You're safe. Then, so you're going to have this, remember, this is what we have discussed earlier, right? So this is your, think about this two peer, right? So we have talked about this earlier. If you forgot, maybe just review your earlier chapter. You have two peer. Right, so in, in the first period, you have income Y, you pay tax T. Second period, you have income Y prime, you pay tax T prime. And then the household is gonna choose C and C prime, right, to optimize or maximize lifetime utility. First, let's look at their budget constraint, right? So the basic budget constraint essentially on the left-hand side is their lifetime consumption, present value. Right hand side is their lifetime, lifetime income in present term. Uh, if you if you're a lender, I mean a save, you save, you're gonna face an interest rate R1. Right? Because that's how this is this this is the interest rate you're going to you're gonna get from the bank by saving one dollar. Okay. Now in the current so first, this is your income, Y and the Y prime, and the discount by one plus R1. And the tax. Right, also discounted by one plus R1, right? So this equation says your lifetime consumption, the present value of the lifetime consumption must be equal to or not exceed your lifetime present value income or disposable income to be precise, right? You need to subtract tax. Now let's look at a borrower. The borrower is gonna face higher interest rate. Why they face higher interest rate? is because of the asymmetric information as we discussed in previous slides. Hence, the only difference between borrower and the lender is that the interest rate is different. Now we can look at the diagram, okay? So this diagram just shows you left down wells, okay, depending on which interest rate you use. Okay, so W1, a uh, E1 times one plus R1, let's go back. Is reversed to here, all right? And then the here, this one is E2, is reversed to here, okay? You may wondering, so why we have that? So let me just use this as an example. And then, so we're gonna write C prime as a function of C. So C prime as a function of C, what are we gonna do? So first we're going to multiply both sides by one plus R1 and end up with C times one plus R1 plus C equal to WE1 times one plus R1. This means C prime equal to negative one plus R1 times C plus WE1 times one plus R1. All right, clearly C prime and C, they have negative correlation and this is gonna reflect their related price. Right, remember, so C prime, the related price in terms of C is one over one plus R1. Okay, so this, this is how we divide or rewrite the budget constraint. 
So we write C prime as a function of C, as we discussed earlier. Hence, the, so this, this line is A and B, A, B, this is the line for saver. And the DF is going for borrower, right? Okay, but at the end, at the end, so what happens is that, maybe it goes to the next one, sorry. At the end, so the actual budget constraint is going to be, is going to be here, or AEF. Why is that? So whether you are a saver and a borrower, depending on depending on how much you consume, right? So this is your endowment. This is the endowment. If currently you consume less than you endow, and that meaning you are saver. If you're a saver, and then you're going to take this line. All right? Now, if you consume more than you endow, it goes this direction, and then you are, you are a borrower. If you're a borrower, you're going to take this line. Or it goes to here. Hence, AEF, that is the budget constraint faced by a typical households. But then, so depending on where you are, if you go to this direction, I mean, if you go to this region, right, you're going to face R1. If you go to this region, you're going to face R2, right? So without this asymmetric information, and then so your budget constraint is going to AB, whether you borrow a lender, Right, so you always face the interest rate R1. But now because of the asymmetric information, okay, R1 and R2 are different. So hence you're gonna face AEF. Now let's see what would happen if default premium increase or A decrease, meaning R2 is gonna increase, right? First of all, let's go back. If R2 increase, meaning so this line is going to get even steeper, right? So then, so you're going to see, so this part, let me erase everything, so it's clear. Okay. So if, if A decrease, the fraction of default, defaulter is going to increase, meaning R2 is going to increase. Now this line, the DF line, is become steeper. Okay, so hence the house is going to face a steeper boring line. So it goes here, right? So R two is going to increase. Now R two increase, what impact is going to have on um, your consumption saving this thing? It goes here. So first, so substitution effect. So one over one minus R two. So R2 increase, this is going to decrease. C prime is going to increase. C is going to decrease. Right? So this substitution effect. Now wealth effect. So wealth effect essentially, so because you're borrower, right? The so borrower, you are going to poor because you are going to owe more to the bank. Right? Because you have debt. So meaning is you're going to consume. So meaning, so if the default premium increase, the consumption is going to fall and keep falling. Now, think about what happened in financial crisis. So during the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, so essentially the default premium increase, the more people default on their house. The interest rate increase, and then he enhanced, this is going to have impact on C, but that's actually is going to drag down the aggregate demand, make the recession even deeper. Now let's look at the graph, right? So we start with A, E, D. Remember, remember, so A, E, this part, if we are, if we are here, this is, this is a cutoff line. So what is E essentially an endowment? A, E line, so if you, if you choose, if you choose consumption along this line, this, this portion, you're gonna face R1. Now, if you wanna consume more than you endow today, meaning you have to borrow, and then you're going to face R2. Okay, if A decreases, and then the ED is going to shift inward, goes to EF, meaning R2 is going to increase. This is what happened, right? Okay. So now we understand the impact of asymmetric information 
on borrowing rate and lending rate and understand how that affects consumer. So next I'm going to introduce the government to further explain these this financial this financial imperfection, how this financial market imperfection is going to affect consumers, and maybe it's going to have some policy implications. And to understand that, now let's say, for example, we introduce government. For the government, we make the following assumption: government borrow and then lend is going to in the same rate as phase, as lender phase. Why is that? It's because so in, 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 in American history, the US government, government never, or the treasury department never default. Meaning to them, I mean, the market perceived the US government as A equal to what? They never default. They are never bring us, brought us any risk. So that just means, okay, to, for the government, their borrowing rate equal to their borrowing rate equal to lending rate, the same rate. So this risk are free, All right? So this is government. And as I'm going to show you, the simply implies equi recordians equivalence, as we discussed earlier, is not going to hold. Now let's see why. Let's look at some equations or algebras. Government budget. So let's start with government budget, and then so later I'm going to bring you back to the Households. Okay, what's the government budget? Government has spending, G and the G prime. Okay, but then so we'll look at present value, so divided by one plus R1. They have income, T and the T prime, and divided by one plus R1. All right, so this is government. Now, actually, so this term, let's go back, already show off, show over here. So the here already show up and uh sorry already show up here right households pay tax here we use lower t means households capital t means government meaning so because government is going to face a bunch of households but in equal even this lowercase t equal to uppercase t households pay tax where tax go I actually goes to g and then, so if the government change G or change T, immediately that's going to have impact on households through small, small lowercase t. All right, so let's go back to how government problem again. Okay. If the government implement a tax call, right? So implement tax call today. And then to offset this tax call or to finance government spending, so they're going to increase future tax. But then clearly still here, so the government is going to borrow. All right? But are we going to, we're going to simplify that, or we can, because there are some terms that are going to cancel with each other. Okay, so we just look at this lifetime budget. In any case, so the current tax decreased by this amount, that immediately means the future tax must increase by this amount. Earlier, without asymmetric information, so these things are going to cancel each other. I mean, to the to the houses, right? So maybe let's go back again. Okay. To the houses, what this means? So that means this term is going to decrease by delta t, but this term is going to increase by delta t times one plus r one. And then, so if you divide by one plus r one, because this, this is how it how it enters the government's how this enters household's budget. And this is going to cancel with each other. This is the this is exactly the recording equivalence we talked about earlier. Meaning the tax cut has no real impact because eventually the government must raise tax to come to to pay for the tax cut we have today. Meaning to the guard to the households there's no real change in their lifetime wealth, meaning they're not going to change their consumption. All right, but with asymmetric information, things are going to be different. How do you different? Okay. First of all, this is, this is a tax, this is a tax change to the households. 
right? So negative delta t plus delta t times one plus r one. All right. Now, if you are a saver, it just doesn't matter, right? Because for the saver, you're going to discount this by one plus r one, as I just show you. However, if you're a borrower, because you are borrowing at R2, but the government is going to borrow at R1, now it's going to make a difference. How does it make a difference? Let me skip this. Let's look at it here. Okay. For saver, the impact is zero, as we discussed. Now, for borrower, the impact is going to be followed. Currently, they have a reduction in tax, but in the future, they pay a higher tax. So what's the tax they're going to pay? It's going to be delta t divided by 1 plus r1. Now they're going to discount by today because the borrower is going to face higher interest rate. Hence, you're going to discount it with higher interest rate. Now we just collect all the terms. You end up with equal to here. And clearly, so this term, look, this term is, negative, is, is less than 1, right? Because r2 is greater than r1. And this term is going to be this term is going to be positive, right? So hence, hence, so remember, so this delta t is negative, right? Hence, so the borrower is going to have a real impact, meaning so the tax cut is going to increase the lifetime wealth of the borrower. So maybe we can look at this at the at the diagram. Right? So where we start? We start with we start with here, E1. We start with E1. Right? So the house is gonna face the budget constraint of A, E1, and B. That's where we start. We just look at someone, I mean ideally, this someone would like to consume at G. Now, if someone would like to consume G and immediately means this is a borrower, right? Because this is what, what this individual is going to end up. But this is what this individual is going to consume for today. So this is the amount of borrow. Because of the asymmetric information, because R2 is greater than R1, this individual is not possible to choose a consumption at the G. Now, because the interest rate is too high. The best that they can do is just choose the point that we call a kink point or a corner solution. Goes here. So this is where we start. Now, if the government cut tax today, and then they're going to raise tax in the future, now we are going to move to A, E2, F. Why this is going to extend? This is exactly because the tax cut is going to increase their left hand wells. Let's right? just follow what we just discussed. Now, clearly, so now at this, at, in this new line with this new budget constraint, and now clearly what happened? What's going to happen? The households are going to choose higher level. So this I is in different curve. Or the house is going to move from E1 to E2. Okay, so this tax cut actually indeed is going to is going to allow the consumer to borrow more to consume more so eventually the aggregate expenditure or aggregate demand is going to increase right or this recording equivalent is going to fail right now we go to the second reason why or what caused the asymmetric information and why there's financial market imperfection so this is called limited commitment. And what's limited, what is the limited commitment? Usually show up as the impossibility for a borrower to commit to pay off his or her debt. Because it's always tempting to default on your debt because you essentially it's like you can walk away and it's, it's the equivalent you just steal some money from the bank or from the lender, right? Why not do, why not do that? Again, this is before we invent some device to prevent this to happen. Right. Okay. 
But then, so one way we people think about, or so we have the discover is that with some collateral, what is collateral? Give example. If you want to borrow from the bank, and then so you just give the bank something as a promise, like say, for example, your house or your car, right? So this is a collateral, meaning just in case you walk away from your debt or from your loan, the bank is going to take control of the assets you use as collateral, this collateral requirement. Formerly, a collateral is assets owned by the borrower. Okay, this is when you borrow, but then the lender, usually the bank, has a right, has the right to see if the borrower is default, meaning when you walk away. A house is a collateral for mortgage loan. Your car is a collateral when you take an auto loan. Okay. So I give examples, right? So in the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, there's burst when, when the housing bubble burst. In a city like Phoenix, Las Vegas, Miami, those are what we call the sand state city. So this is like housing market. This, this is a place, the housing market was extremely hot because those are, they, they have nice weather and people willing to invest or buy a house over there. Price have fallen by up to 50% from their peak in those region. The amount of collateral house declined. Right, so this is one example. But now this, we need to understand if the value of the collateral decline, how would that affect your consumption and saving decision? Right, so by the way, this is what happens during that time period. So this housing price index, right? It's peak time, so it's rise by 15, 16%. And then in the just in the matter of two years, it declined by this 16, 20, almost 40%. All right, so this collateral, this value of collateral decline is gonna have impact on consumption through two channels. Number one, if the collateral, if the amount of the collateral declines, so remember, so we just think about the house, right? So we view your house as a collateral, right? And then you borrow from the bank. If the amount of the collateral decline, so that's going to reduce your ability to borrow because you have less collateral, right? And then so you have limited ability to borrow. If you have a limited ability to borrow, and then so you're gonna reduce your consumption. This is the first channel. Second channel is, is work through the wealth effect. Because usually house, it's the main wealth for most Americans. If your house loses your value, your wealth decline, and certainly you're going to reduce your consumption. Right? But empirically, so one is more important than two. Hence, in the following analysis, we're going to focus on the first one. Essentially, the collateral value decline, and then that's going to limit your ability to borrow, and you're going to reduce the consumption. Now let's just look look at this through a simple model. Here we assume, I mean, this is just follow up with earlier earlier model we have. Now instead of say, okay, borrowing rate, interest rate, different. Now we're just going to simplify. We are going to simplify that. So instead we'll say, so there's a there's a limit you can borrow. And furthermore, we are going to introduce one more thing in this model, which is a house. We said households, each household own a house. The price of the house is P, and the quantity of house is H. Just you can think about this, the size of a house, right? And then, then the total lifetime wealth of the house is going to be as follows. These are the way you had before, one minus T. Oh, sorry, y minus t and the y prime minus t prime the same. Now, furthermore, you have this value of a house. Here, the house usually we say is illiquid, right? Just imagine if you want to use the value of the house to pay for something, 
like gay or still no. What you can do, usually you have to sell your house, right? So this is illiquid. The simple way I would say, okay, so you may be able to sell, you may be sell, this is like two period model. You may be able to sell your house at the end of the second period, right? You cannot do that in the first period because this is like illiquid, right? And then your lifetime wealth is going to be equal to the original term we have plus the value of the house and discounted by one plus R. Remember, there's no R1, R2. There's only one R, okay? So we're going to look at different, we're going to look at different imperfection or we look at different friction in this financial market. Now we are going to have a collateral constraint, right? Okay, so what is a collateral constraint? So by the way, so this collateral constraint is going to eliminate the default problem we have before. Let's see how. So you feel free to borrow, and I'm going to lend you at an interest rate of R, this is from the bank. However, how much you can borrow cannot exceed the value of your house. So this is going to prevent you to default. Why? Because, okay, whatever you can borrow is up to the value of the house. Right? Yes, you can walk away, and then, so you're going to lose your house. Because you borrow less than the value of your house, and then so you don't have incentive to walk away. Right? So essentially, this collateral constraint is going to is going to eliminate the default problem as we have discussed in previous model. Right? And by the way, here is is negative. But usually is is saving. If positive it means really saving. If it's negative, meaning you borrow. Right? So the total, total amount you borrow today is negative A's. Right? <coughs> so now the, given this constraint, that means this constraint, right? so the amount you borrow cannot exceed pH. Now we can do the simply, we can do this simple algebra. Negative A's must less than or equal to pH divided by one plus R. Remember this is what you borrow. Hence, your consumption, your current consumption cannot exceed Y minus T, this is what you endow, plus the amount you borrow. All right. So this is how the budget constraint will look like. So A, B, so without collateral constraint, so your A, B, so your budget constraint will be here. If there's no default, and then so you are feel free to choose somewhere here. Because there's a default, I mean, there's a, there's a possibility of default. And then so the bank introduces this collateral constraint, meaning so you cannot borrow up to here. And what is this level? So this is essentially Y, this is your endowment, right? So this is Y minus T plus P times H divided by one plus R, right? So, or in other words, so this distance is P times H divided by one plus R. Right? And then the best that you can do is just hit here. Remember, so if you originally want to borrow to this amount, right? And then so the best you can do is here. Okay. So this is with uh, cloud cards, right? Not just image, if the housing market collapse. Okay, remember this difference is pH divided by one plus R. Now, if P decline, and then this turn is going to decline, and this is going to collapse, it's move to the left hand side, meaning so we are going to move to F, G, and H. Okay. You may be wondering why we move from A to F. This is because, look at here, on the vertical line, Y prime minus T prime plus PH, right? So if P decline, and then so this is going to decline as well. So clearly you can see if there's a healthy market collapse, that's going to reduce consumption, right? So clearly you can see, so the current consumption reduced from D to H, right? So that's going to reduce the aggregate demand and make the recession even deeper, right? So this is summarized by here. Financial crisis decrease P, healthy market collapse. Negative wealth effect, budget line shift left. 
And then, or furthermore, there's a collateral constraint. Right, so this classical constraint getting tighter is increase. This is technically means I mean here because the because s is a negative number. If s increase, meaning this entire term is going to decrease. Right, so households can borrow less, and c is going to decrease. Right, so this mechanic is planned part of the decrease in durable consumption during the financial crisis, right? C decrease, right? So now we are going to look at something slightly different, but still there's some imperfection in the market. We are going to look at a social security system, okay? So we start with pay as you go. What is pay as you go? So this says the government is going to introduce a social security system. They're going to finance this social security system with pay as you go tax system. Meaning, what that means? Meaning, so whatever benefit you're going to distribute to the current population is going to finance by all the tax we can collect. This is like pay as you go. Pay the benefit as you go. I mean, as, as whatever you can collect. So there's going to be tax on working population. This tax is going to use to finance social security transfer to the retire at each period, right? And here, so now we are going to introduce like slightly different model. We have two period, two generation, not only two period, we have two generation. So there's young generation and old generation. The young is going to pay a social security tax of T is per person. Old is going to receive a social security benefit of B, this per person. The structure model is going to look at as follows. At each time period, you have young, you have old. And then in the next period, young becomes old. And the next period, old is going to disappear. But now you have a new young comes in. And this young becomes old in the next period. And then they are going to disappear. Now let's look at each period. So the young is going to pay a tax T. Old is going to receive benefit B, right? It's the same. So the young is going to pay a tax T. The old is going to receive a benefit B, right? So now we need to determine the relationship between T and B. Before I show you the next slide, one more thing. Now there's a population growth. The population growth at one plus N Meaning, so if today you have one people, next period is going to have one plus n individuals. But how this population growth show up? So if you have one here, okay, if you have one here, this is going to be one. This is going to be one. Population growth means, okay, so here now you have one plus n. But so look at we we'll look at one at one point of time. So you old, you have one, and young, you have one plus n. And then so if you have one here, it must be one over one plus n. So the young population, the ratio of young over old is always one plus n. So this is the structure of this um, symbol model, right? This is summarized right here. Let me just rewrite this, okay? So you have young, terms old. Old is going to disappear, right? But now you have young terms old. Old is going to disappear. Young terms old, right? So this this one year, let's just, let's just say, remember, so everyone lived for two periods, and the meaning, so one period probably is like 40 years. So if you get them, this is 1940. Now this is 1980. This is 2020. This is 2040. This is how the model works. So if you have one here and you have one here, no one dies before their life cycle. And then here you have one plus n because of the population growth. And then so here you have one plus n as well. Now here you're going to have one plus n squared. I right, said so this is the structure of this model. Social security benefit, because it's pay as you go. 
This is the total tax you're going to collect. This is the total benefit you have to pay. They have to equal to each other. Why you have N and N prime? It's because if you look at any year, so you have two different cohorts, right? So their ratio is exactly one plus N. So that's why we have here, right? This, this total benefit equal to total tax. But this immediately means tax equal to benefit divided by one plus N, right? So now we are ready to look at this social security system, its impact on households. Let's start with someone who are old when we just introduced the social security, All right? Originally, originally, they start with A, B, right? So this is their budget constraint, okay? And this is their original consumption. Now, once we introduce this social security, so the budget constraint move up to D and F. Why? So look at here. So this basically this budget line for the initial old move up by move up by B. How is why I say that? Because this is parallel. This line is this line parallel. And this distance equal to this distance. And this distance equal to what? Equal to B. Now why does it move up by B? Because the original, when the same example, if we introduced social security system in 1940, but actual days a little bit late, later, right? Okay, so let's say example 1940, we introduced social security. The day we introduced social security, the old, the current old is gonna receive B. Right? But they know they don't need to pay tax because they already turned old. Right? So they just benefit. Right. So they immediately receive a B. So they move up. And immediately, so their consumption is gonna move from H to G to J. And clearly, so they are going to better off. Right. Now let's look at someone who born in PRT or later. Meaning, when we introduce nine, when you introduce the social security in 1940, so they need to pay tax T, they know they're gonna receive benefit B. Now let's see what happens. First of all, this is their this is their original line, A B. Right? So this is the endowment. Now, after the introduction of the social security, they're gonna to change to DF. See how different DF differ. So first, the endowment, the current endowment is going to go through here. I mean, the endowment point is going to move from E1 to E2, right? So the current endowment is going to reduce because they need to pay tax. This is the tax they pay. In the future, they're going to receive B, right? And then as you can see, so the endowment move from here to here. Right, and here I just show you the case. So this curve is a move up, move up a lot, right? And then, so the household is going to better off. But indeed, so whether the household is going to better off or not, is going to depend on the N, right? So if N is sufficiently high, as we show, show here, meaning their decline, in endowment in the first period so sufficient small and then the households this household is going to better out we are going to see here on the other hand if n is sufficiently small right meaning so this is going to they're going to read so there's going to large decline in their endowment and then you're going to see a worse off right so summarize so the pay as you go system is better, is beneficial only if the population growth exceeds the real interest rate, right? The, what is the interpretation and why we have that? So maybe let me just use one slide here. For the households, their budget constraint is going to look at as follows. C plus C prime divided by one plus R equal to Y minus T 
plus y prime minus t prime divided by one plus r. Now with social security, so this is going to equal to one minus, this is the tax that pay, b divided by one plus n plus y prime. So they're going to receive b, right? Plus b divided by one plus r, right? So now this is equal to y plus y prime divided by one plus r, right? And then plus b, one plus r, minus b, one plus n. Now clearly this loss term, if a is greater than r, and clearly loss term, is greater than zero, right? So higher the larger a, the smaller this number, right? So this is greater than zero. So that just means if n is greater, is sufficient large, the social security system is going to make the household worse a uh, bit off. Why? Because they are going to enjoy a larger lifetime wealth compared in the system without social security. But if you examine this, this term more carefully, so essentially it says the social security system work as additional saving and with the return of N, okay, with the return of N. How we understand this return with n? Because basically today you paid b divided by one plus n, tomorrow you receive b. So effectively the return of the social security is one plus n. And this r one plus n is greater than one plus r. That's how it makes you better off. But what happens if n is less than r? And then so this system is not going to is not going to work. Actually, this is a challenge faced by many advanced economies. Right now, they are, gonna, they, are, they are seeing or they're experiencing a population growth slowing down. In some countries, they even have negative population growth and clearly it's gonna bring some trouble. But in any case, this is the pay as go system and how the pay as go system can improve welfare. But you may wonder how this affect, how this related to the financial market friction. This is largely because, largely because, maybe go through here, largely because, so there's a missing market. What is the missing, what, what, what does that mean? Here, you live for two periods, young and old. Yes, you want to save, right? And that's who we are going to lend your money to. And this, in, in this framework, the, the only way you, Lend to is lend to when you're young, you only lend to old, right? But the trouble is when you become old, you want to get your money out. This old is, is already disappeared. It's not in the, it's not in the economy anymore. So this social security system is kind of link everyone together, right? So you are going to this, this young lend money to, to this generation. And in the future, so the future generation is going to lend money to them. So in some sense, so this is like, okay, so this young is going to do business with this young, but this young is not, hasn't born yet. Meaning, so the market is not going to resolve this issue. And then the government steps in to mitigate this missing market. All right, so this is social security. Now to close this part, so I'm going to look at full fund, full funded social security. So essentially, this is a mandatory saving program, right? So for the old assets acquired by the young, they will be they will they will put in a retirement fund, and then so when you old when your terms old, and then the government is going to give you back. This is like full fund. So this is how this full fund look like, right? So basically, basically. This is where we where you are, where you are. All right. So this for instance. Now, if you are if you are here, I mean, this is when you want to, when you want to save, right? And then so this is this everything is fine. So the government is going to save for you. It's going the government is going to is is force you to save, and then you're fine. 
But however, if your endowment is here, your endowment is here, right? But you don't have money to save. You don't have money to save, right? So this is what the government wants you to save, but you don't have money to save. And then this full finance, full fund is so your security system is not going to work. All right, I'm going to, so to summarize, what do we learn? So in this chapter, we look at the financial market imperfection. And we focus on two types. One is the asymmetric information. The other is the limited commitment. Using, using two simple models, I explained to you, so under those cases, how this market imperfection is going to affect your consumption and a saving decision. And furthermore, I use this simple model to explain some government policy, like say, for example, if, the, if there's a tax card, how would that affect your consumption and saving? And if there's a collapse in housing market, how would that affect your consumption and saving? And we close this part by looking at the social security system. But the key takeaway for the social security system is that in the private market, there's some markets missing. Like because you cannot trade with someone who is not born yet. And then this social security system essentially work as a bridge to connect current young. Let's go back to this slide. This is going to connect, is connect this young generation to the future young generation who is not born 